I'm truly grateful for being able to talk with a growing number of people from all across the globe about healing, wellness, and mindfulness practices. My next guest, Ramon Newman, is no exception. He operates and advises from a place of creation, clarity, fulfillment, and bliss consciousness. Early on, he was recognized as an accomplished athlete. And then he shifted gears and he went on to be a meditation monk for 10 years. These days, hours of meditation are still a common practice of his. He, and now along with his business partner, Paolo D'Angelo, now coach, advise, and partner with CEOs and company owners to grow their business by helping them to step into their power and to completely shift their world. They have an unbelievable track record growing their clients' companies by millions and even billions of dollars. So please join me on this truly enlightening discussion. Thank you so much. If you're do doing something and you're focused on doing something, but somehow it's not getting the effect that you want, then you have to go even deeper than those things. And you have to go into that realm of believing and, and having clarity, you know, about what you really are and what you really want to create. Uh, because a lot of people get caught up in the doing and the focusing, but they're not believing. They're not really owning the reality and believing in the reality they want to create. So they're just working hard and they're getting really busy and they're getting really tired and they're getting really stressed. And so what we found is that leaders who can really get the believing part of the equation right and really have that crystal clear clarity about what they are creating and then believing in it, then when they do do the actions, they get more support from their environment. Purification of that doubt, like you say, letting go of it. Mm -hmm. and, and the best way to do that is to really just transcend and get back to consciousness, right? Because right. consciousness is like, it will just give you, I mean, the way I like to look at consciousness is like, you know, if we want to project images onto a screen, then we need the film, but we, but almost even more important than the film, the images aren't going to get projected onto that screen, be it the marketplace or whatever, unless there's enough light behind that's shining through that projector, through those images right. onto the screen. So the more that you light up this brain physiology and get into that global alpha state, then you just own this reality and you just project it naturally, almost without even having to try because you're just living that reality. A lot of leaders and, and, and people in general, we make achievement the goal. The ultimate goal is fulfillment, right? And fulfillment is not something we achieve. Fulfillment is something that's already innate. It's something that we experience. And fulfillment ultimately comes from experiencing what your true nature is, which is consciousness, your bliss consciousness. And what that means is that you have a settled mind and you have a content heart. So you're a, a CEO coach working with, I guess, corporate executives, corporate uh, with corporate health and corporate wellness. Yeah. Um, and yeah, tell me a little bit how you got started with all this. You know, I understand that you were a, a competitive athlete. Yep. And then sometime after that, you spent actually 10 years as a meditation monk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not something I was expecting to do because I was one of these typical ambitious kids in my teenage years. I was, I was very competitive. I played rugby for 10 years, won uh, about four provincial titles. Uh, was a competitive athlete, won national, regional, provincial titles, uh, wanted to qualify for the World Junior Championships as a, as a way to take myself from being a good national athlete to being an international athlete. And oh. my running coach at the time, who was a, actually a coach of uh, Olympic gold medalist, John Walker, who won the 76 Olympics, was the first man to run in three minutes, 50 seconds for the mile. He said to me, he said, look, if you stay healthy and you keep up your progress and your training, there's no reason why you can't go to the Olympics. So wow. when someone gives you that sort of validation endorsement, you go, okay, I'm all in. Right. And you know, you're doing something right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I just, I'm, I've got something here and I was very good at the training. I was like, I just loved to train. You know, I was one of these people that were just really into training. Uh, unfortunately, I was so good at training that I just corrupted my ability to stay healthy. And, you know, I, because when you, when you put yourself, especially as a middle distance runner running the mile, you accumulate a lot of lactic acid right. and that lactic acid is very kind of detrimental to the, 
to the body. And so I was very good at the training. I was not good at the recovery. I just didn't have that knowledge on how to recover and how to revitalize. And so I just kept training. I just, you know, I kept on pounding out the miles and building out the fatigue and building out more of that lactate in my body. And then my body just got to the point where, you know, I had a lot of respiratory problems, a lot of digestive problems, and it just kept wow. me up most nights for, you know, I felt like I was an insomniac for six months. Uh, I got very depressed and I felt like I lost my sole purpose in life to be a competitive mm-hmm. athlete, a professional athlete. And so that kind of, you know, I guess you didn't really know about uh, balance so much no. at that time of your life. No, I, I was just of the mindset, the ambitious mindset that if you just put in the work and you do the training, um, then you're going to get somewhere. And I didn't realize there's another component to another side to that, which we'll, we'll get in here. And, you know, I was ambitious, ambitious with my, my sport. I was also wanting to be an investment banker. You know, I was very inspired by that. And that just all kind of dissipated, you know, around when I turned 20, 21. And I just had that life altering experience where I you know, flipped the switch from wanting to be so outward and ambitious to wanting to be so inward and, and really exploring that depth of, of consciousness. And I, wow. the, 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 the kind of the switch that sparked that was when I learned to meditate, I learned to transcend, I learned transcendent meditation uh, after I was, I was burning out as a way to, okay, I've got to take care of this inside. And my first time I meditated and transcended, I thought, oh my God, I don't have to run five miles a day to feel like I'm in the zone. Uh, because that contrast between thinking I was a very relaxed, chill person to actually experience what that deepest level of relaxation. So that, that was one of the first times you did transcendental meditation and you had that sort of experience. Yeah. Yeah. It was right, wow. from, right from the get go. Now, had you done other really sorts right. of uh, meditations prior to that? No, no. I mean, I, I kind of like I got curious about it. I actually went into the library. I pulled out a book. I was about TM and I was just. You know, sometimes you read books and you get this visceral experience from the book going, oh, this is okay. something I've got to do this. i got to look into this. I actually didn't immediately go and go and learn. I just kind of let it sit. And I, I tried my own meditation. You know, I used different words or something like that. I didn't really know, have any idea what I was doing. And then finally, you know, some athletes in my training squad who were winning national titles said, yeah, we've, we've been doing TM and it's been really helpful. And and so I went along to the intro, didn't really even really want to listen to the intro. I just said, just give me the experience. And so as soon as I had that experience, it was like I walked out of that first experience of allowing my mind to transcend and really settle down like I was walking on the clouds. You know, it was that much of a contrast between what I thought relaxation was and what actual relaxation is. So and then you were like, hey, maybe I will take some time off and become a meditation monk. Yeah, it, it kind of and, un- and, and one year became ten. Yeah, it kind of unfolded. You know, you, you ultimately we all follow our bliss, right? And we we may struggle to find that bliss, but then eventually we go, oh man, this is so good. I just feel I just want more of this. So I actually went to uh, I came to the America and grew up in New Zealand and came to America and and most people come to America because they want opportunity and name or fame or fortune and stuff like that. I actually came to America because I wanted self knowledge. And I went to a university in Fairfield, Iowa called MIU, Marshy International University, where actually okay. encouraged students to, to meditate, to, to do TM, to develop their brain potential and develop their consciousness and awareness. So I was very curious about that. So I went there, uh, worked on staff, did some continuing education programs, and then got to expand my meditation practice, do some more advanced techniques. And then that led to me becoming part of like, it was kind of like boot camp basic training to become a monk. So I was meditating, I started meditating one, two, three, four hours a day. And then I got to the point where I go, okay, how can I do this full time? And then I was, I learned that there was a facility in the Blue Ridge Mountains, North Carolina, just outside of Boone. And there you could go and meditate full time, eight hours a day, seven days a week. Um, there was a men's campus, there was a woman's campus, and it was just men and women from around different countries, different ethnics, different religions, just coming to have this experience that's so that's that's very strange to me that you would come to america to have that sort of experience yeah no it is it is possible in the u.s i mean it's interesting the america you know it's obviously the most dynamic country in the world it's the most creative country in the world but underneath that i think there's a deep deep spirituality here and you have to find it you have to seek it out you have to dig dig into it you have to (laughs) 
yeah. really I dig to find it. <laughs> you know, there, there is a lot of, you know, spirituality here through the American Indian people. And, and oh, fair enough. Like, yes. The movements here that you can find. And I managed to connect in with the TM movement. And that was kind of, you know, my experience of, of getting into that reality more. Um, obviously, you know, the temptation to, to want to, you know, do the typical American thing and, and stuff like that was there. But again, it was just my bliss was stronger for the inner experience than the outer experience at that point in my life. Gotcha. Wow. Um, so, so now you have a business called um, New Mavericks. I have my notes over here, so that's why. <laughs> um, and you have a business partner, um, Palio D'Angelo. Am I getting that right? Yeah, Paolo D'Angelo. Yep. He's, okay. a, he's an Italian, raised, raised an Italian family, speaking Italian, but in Australia. So he's a, basically an Australian Italian or Italian Australian, whichever way you want to look at it. And were you saying that he had kind of a, a similar yeah. journey as you did? Yeah, he uh, he was actually into the bodybuilding world and uh, he was uh, in the process of becoming a competitive bodybuilder. Like he could leg press like 1,200 pounds oh, without boy. steroids without steroids and he had a nutrition company, a security company and an entertainment uh, ticket, ticket selling business. And then at the age of 25, he just felt something's not, not satisfying me. And, and he basically gave all that up and, wow. and joined my meditating program. And uh, yeah, he, he's an interesting guy because he didn't graduate high school and okay. he's been around wealthy people, you know, since the age of 19, very kind of Italian street smart, and and but also very spiritual and so you know he's he's you know we're now working with ceos of multi-million multi-billion dollar companies and yet he doesn't even he didn't even graduate high school and so oh. it's, it, i mean he's a great example of of what you can do if you really develop your consciousness and really you know believe in in your potential so you you two now basically merge the uh the field of of business and mindfulness um well this is something that you had said uh the other day when we were talking so you primarily work with business leaders uh many times as like a silent partner or yep. sometimes as a silent partner um you'll meditate for eight hours a day and then call your the business leader up in the afternoon and, and you help them debunk uh, from your level of awareness your your meditative kind of level of awareness yep. any stresses or issues and help them with um protection about uh, around any issues that they're dealing with yeah yeah and exactly. i think that's just very cool so you basically you're almost meditating on their behalf trying to problem solve on their behalf and then yeah. where i mean we, we started this this business as a way to support that monastic lifestyle and then when we both left that um lifestyle in 2007 we decided to do it on a on a more full-time basis so you know we still meditate a few hours every day um, but we're not doing the eight hours we were in that monastic setting. Um, gotcha. so now we're a little more outward, you know, than we were in that environment, but yeah, it's the basis of what we do is that having good awareness, which comes from really experiencing that field of consciousness that you right. consciousness that we're all, you know, intimately connected to, but we lose sight of. And so it's really about enlivening that field first and then coming into the field of action and activity with that broader awareness of things. So, yeah, so tell me a little bit more about that. Um, so, so what is this protection? Why is it important um, in, in leadership and, and just the general public as well? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we decided to cotton on to the theme of protection because we noticed that initially when we were doing this business, we were like all about supporting their achievement and progress. Yet we would notice certain things would happen with these leaders, either with their health or their relationships or even their wealth that would kind of corrupt or diminish that process of achieving. So one example is that we helped a CEO grow a company from 1 billion to 7 billion in the space of seven years. Wow. And it was all, it was all great. We thought, wow, fantastic. You're doing great. But we knew underneath something wasn't quite right. And so we would, encourage this lead and say, hey, look, it's fantastic. You're achieving these amazing things, but you need to take care of your health, right? Because you're absorbing a lot of stress and a lot of pressure in making these big deals happen. 
And he would acknowledge that and he would feel that, but he wouldn't really do anything that we felt he needed to do to protect himself. So long story short, he, we end up, we have a call scheduled. We get an email from him. He's in hospital saying, guys, I can't do the call. I'm having a stroke. Oh my gosh. And so this was a real wake up call for him. And so we, lucky enough for him, we, he was then open to what we felt he needed to do for his health. And we got him connected with uh, one of the top Ayurvedic doctors in the world. And we had him start taking some supplements to basically strengthen his neurons and his nervous system and his mind. And he, he, he engaged in that program. Uh, he's now retired, um, but he's probably back to close to, you know, 95 98 percent of his you know former ability and agility he was able to recover you know to a very high degree so wow. we're, but, but we realize we don't want to have the people to experience this we want to avert this this thing so this idea of the science of protection which is the name of the book we brought out last year right. is really about a pro, an inside out proactive protection it's not based on uh, security systems or cyber security or, you know, any of these reactive systems of protection. And it's really about, you know, the way I define it, it's a universal force um, of intelligence that creates, maintains and dissolves based on what is good for the whole to survive, thrive and evolve. And this is happening in our physiology. Our physiology is constantly protecting us from viruses and things that could really disrupt our experience of life. It's happening in gotcha. our environment. And so protection is, you know, it's not commonly talked about in, in this sense, but it is there, it is below the surface. And, and it's our job as people to be in tune with that protective intelligence so that we can actually gotcha. achieve as much as we want for as long as we want without getting diminished or corrupted by stress or vices or fear um, or incoherences that can really, you know, spoil that process of, of progress. So the book, um, which is Science of Achievement, is that correct? Science of Protection. Yep. Science of Protection. My apologies. Um, there it, are it six. Come, it is inspired by the Science of Achievement, which Tony okay. wrote about. And we, All right. realized, okay. we realized that the Science of Achievement required a Science of Protection to really ensure that that achievement doesn't get diminished and corrupted. And you actually mentioned six steps. Yes. in that book is that is that correct yeah, yeah. We, we we diagnosed there's about six qualities um that a leader needs to to really have that value of protection in them and around them and that the first quality is purification you know we have to purify the stresses the the vices or the incoherences uh, in our mind in our physiology so that we don't you know make poor decisions i mean a lot of the 2007 2008 uh, financial meltdown is very, very smart, very intelligent leaders making poor decisions. And because they were driven like by things like uh, greed, lust, vanity, jealousy, all these things that they, they, they're gripped by that makes them want to like take shortcuts to achieving. And right. so then eventually, you know, when we build up that wrong, wrong value in life, then eventually nature creates an experience for us to realize, okay, that's not the right way to go about it. We get taught the lessons. So we realized, you know, I was in New York City actually in that time when I'd left being a monk and I was doing an acting program for a couple of years just to kind of reintegrate with the world. And I could feel the stress in the city as people were getting laid off and there's so much uncertainty about what's going on. And I realized they had the same problem that I did. They were so focused on the, on the outer development and achievement and not on their own inner development and protection. Can you mention briefly some of these steps that you would, that you would take? Yeah, um, exactly. So, so the, the first one is, is the purification. There's okay, a saying, makes sense. Purification, purification leads to progress. You know, sometimes, you know, there's obstacles. And the reason why there's obstacles is because there's resistances, right? Either mentally, emotionally, or physically, uh, in our physiology or in our relationships or in our environment. So we have to purify those resistances first, and then that provides a basis for things to unfold in a better way. Gotcha. So purification is the first step, purifying the stress. You know, we know when we're stressed and we're not settled, we're not thinking right, and everything seems like it's a problem. But when we're in a good state, 
of clarity. We don't feel stressed. Pretty much nothing's a problem. We can handle anything. Right. So we, the, the, that's the first value. The second value that evolves out of that is coherence. And what they've found is that world-class athletes and business leaders and musicians, when they're performing at their best, they're making the best decisions, they have a unique style of brain functioning. And it's called global alpha coherence. Now, what that means in layman's terms is that their mind is very settled, but also at the same time, very alert. So they're awake to the bigger picture. They're awake to the finer details that will enable that bigger picture to unfold. And they're just in that flow state, right? Where they're just right. shooting the right thought at the right time. And so that's what leaders have to have to you know, be in that coherent state. It's basically where there's a lot of coherence between all hemispheres of the brain, especially between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Now, a lot of people give the amygdala a bad rap. It's the fear center of the brain. It's the fight, flight, freeze center of the brain. And that's true, but that's the lowest value of the amygdala. The highest value of the amygdala is vigilance. And that's when it's in coherence with the prefrontal cortex, which is the CEO of the brain. So that front part of the brain, it's, it makes us unique as humans. Uh, it makes up like something like 40% of the brain. And that's the part of the brain that makes our very important strategic decisions that plans okay. analyzes and, and makes those important decisions. So when there's coherence in the brain between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, we're able actually to avert problems before they arise and see opportunities as they arise, right? And that's the best Six. state uh, for a leader to be in. And that's what... Uh, coherence does it creates a leadership state which is the third component of the science of protection when you're in a leadership state you're awake to what is truthful and you're in a creative state to see the sequential unfoldment that has to go on for things to move forward and so you know we can say leadership's a position it's a status yes superficially it is but really it's a it's a state of awareness right where you're able to lead yourself and others forward in a very coherent orderly manner Right. So that's that, that those three components, purification, coherence and leadership state, they're like the internal side of the science of protection, that internal development. Okay. The internal uh, components where that, that protection becomes expressed into your environment, into your world, into your leadership is the qualities of capacity, spontaneous right action and deserving power. So capacity is that you have that, awareness you have that ability to literally handle any opportunity or any problem that that comes up you know you're you're not phased you're not affected so a great analogy of this is if you put if we put a uh, a teaspoon of salt water uh, sorry salt into a glass are we going to taste that salt sure right so if we take another teaspoon of salt and we put that into a lake uh, we're going to uh, taste that salt. No. Probably not likely, right? No. So that's that's what it's like. If you really have a broad capacity of awareness, then you're not affected by what goes on. And when you're not able to be affected, then you're in a far better state. Mm-hmm. You're in observing. You have a lot of observing power to be able to navigate what's going on. But if you're entangled in problems, and you're caught up in problems and you're bound by problems, then you don't really have much capacity to solve those problems. So capacity is is a very important basis for having that ability. And and the capacity can mean many things. It can be the capacity to believe. It can be the capacity to have clarity of mind. In fact, if people want to believe more, then they have to have more clarity of mind, right? If people want more clarity of mind, then they have to have more coherence, right? And to get more coherence, you have to purify what's in the way of that coherence because we're all actually having, I believe, the right thought at the right time. But if we're not settled in our mind, then we miss that. You know, we don't don't create thoughts. We just grasp them, right? And so when the mind is stressed, it creates a lot of fragmented thoughts since then we have a lot of thoughts. We feel like we're overthinking. But when we have a very coherent mind, then it's natural. It's like we've all had that experience. Oh, I got to do this now. You know, and and you don't you don't analyze it. You know, it's just a natural unfoldment of what should happen. So when we have that great clarity, then we have a great capacity to believe. And then when we believe, then naturally we focus on the things we take actions on the things that that we need to do. And in that kind of state, 
you're able to take more spontaneous right action. You know, you, it's timely action. You just know Makes when sense. to do the right thing at the right time. Now, it's not say, you know, no one's perfect, right? But when you're in a, a when you have good capacity and you, you're believing and you're naturally focusing because you are believing, then you are more likely to take spontaneous right action on things. And gotcha. the more spontaneous right action you take, the more you build up this power of deserving. You know, when we ever see someone win something, you know, the general conclusion is they deserve to win, right? Or they deserve that accomplishment because they took so many good actions that enabled them to have that positive energy that enabled them to fulfill that desire, right? We, it's, we, another thing we say, good merit. Tony Robbins calls it grace, right? You're just having that support from your environment because you've generated so much good energy, so much good uh, that naturally the environment wants to support you because you deserve to be supported. That makes sense. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so those are the, the external components, the capacity, the spontaneous right action okay. and having power. And this gives a lot of protection around your ach achievement, all these six components together. So in the realm of, uh, you know, of course, everything is going crazy right now around the globe, in yeah. my opinion. Um, and there's a lot of people that are worried about a lot of things. Is there a simple suggestion or maybe just a suggestion Yes. that you could offer that might be able to give someone a peace of mind? Yes, <clears throat> yes, definitely. So any problems, we can basically draw back issues, pandemics, whatever. We can basically draw back to some weakness, right? And usually it's a weakness in the mind, right? Because we all know the mind creates everything. We can't create anything unless the mind has thought that thought and created that reality and creates that reality from there. So we want to really strengthen the mind, right? And I believe you probably also believe that mental health is going to become super important. It already is important, but it's going to become super important in business, in corporations, in, in people's personal lives, you know, that value of mental health. Now, the ability to strengthen the mind doesn't come from thinking, right? It comes from the source of thinking, right? And the source of thinking is our consciousness, now, we're all fluctuating through states of consciousness, waking, dreaming, sleeping states of consciousness. Now, these are relative states of consciousness. They change. They fluctuate. So okay. what we want to do is give, give those relative changing states of consciousness that we have to live through a, a deeper, more foundation value of, of consciousness. And that is what we call the fourth state of consciousness, transcendental consciousness. And this is a state where the mind is very rested and settled, but also very awake and alert at the same time. And that's the state that we want to be in ultimately most of the time. Now, the ability to culture that awareness, that, that state, and live from that fourth state that's very peaceful, that's very settled, that's very awake and coherent, is the allowing the mind to transcend, to go beyond the surface level of thinking, to get back to that simplest form of awareness. Right, that that pure intelligence, that that wakefulness, that ultimately we we are, and that's our nature. Our nature is actually bliss consciousness, and that's why I was able to meditate for ten years full time because I got to experience my true nature, which is bliss consciousness. And gotcha. the more the more you get established in that, the more that you have a, a deeper foundation, and it strengthens it strengthens the mind. You're actually in tune with the right thoughts at the right time, more so. Right. And I guess so, transcendental um, meditation is exactly. one very good way to go. Exactly. Exactly. So TM is one of the most widely researched, validated and practiced um, techniques in the world. Just literally all the top celebrities and business leaders are using it from uh, Jerry Seinfeld and Martin Scorsese and Clint Eastwood. Uh, they've been using TM for a long oh, time. Oh, well, if Clint Eastwood does it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. why why is that? I mean, I hear that um, term um, used quite often. Mm. Why is that so much better than than others? Or right. is it because there's more structure behind it that you can go a little deeper if you use a given structure? Or yeah, TM TM is ultimately the reason why TM is so effective is because it's simple, it's natural, and it's effortless. Okay using the nature of the mind to do what it already wants to do. The mind, the nature of the mind is to be settled. The nature of the body is to act, right? And so when I was an athlete, I was very good at using the nature of my body just to act. I was not good 
and allowing my mind to be settled and experience its, its nature. So okay. TM works like gravity. As soon as you, uh, I, you, it's based on mantra based technique. So you're given a sound that's very uh, specific to you. And this sound has no meaning. It just is, it has a sound quality that is very conducive for the mind to settle down with. So you're, you're given this mantra, you're taught how to use this mantra. Uh, mantra just means, man means mind, tra means vehicle. You're given this mind vehicle, which is a sound. And so this sound allows the mind to naturally do what it wants to do is to be settled. So when, when you're given the sound, you're taught how to use it. And then you're taught how the body through that settling process throws off stress, purifies. Uh, what they've found is that when someone transcends, their cortisol levels drop 30 to 40%. When we sleep, cortisol levels only drop 10 to 12%. So it gives really? a very unique okay. experience of, of, of restfulness, right? That's, that's, not, that's different from sleep. And so this has a very powerful effect of, of activating, especially the T cells in the body. When one meditates, there's a lot of T cell activation, which goes around and cleans up things in the physiology, things in the mind that are kind of blocking that natural flow of intelligence and, and bliss and joy that we are. So, yeah, so TM is a, a very powerful um, technique to, to look into 20 minutes twice a day, ideally to get the most out of it. But it's kind of like you think you're taking 40 minutes out of your day, but you're actually giving yourself more time because you're coming, you're going to come out of that with a more coherent uh, mind, more energy, clarity, creativity. It's kind of like as you pull back, an arrow on a bow, then okay. the arrow is very still and, and it's not going anywhere, but it's got a huge amount of energy and uh, force behind it. So when you let it go, when you let go into activity, you have that much more to give, right? Because you're coming from a deeper, more powerful part of yourself. Mm, that's a very interesting analogy. Okay. So you had mentioned Smriti the other day, a memory supplement. Smriti, yeah, Smriti. So... Smriti okay. is a Sanskrit word for memory, right? And okay. so basically everything runs on a, on a memory of, of how it should work, right? So that's why we have a DNA, which gives us the intelligence to tell the cell how to operate. Mm. And then those cells coordinate with all other cells. So when a cell loses that memory of its innate intelligence to be healthy, then we get issues, we get problems, we get cancer, right? And that's everyone pretty much knows is that cancer is the loss of, of the cell's memory on how to function properly with all the other cells. So this supplement uh, is an Ayurvedic supplement. It's created by a family, one of the uh, top Ayurvedic families in the world, the Raju family. Go to drraju.com. And this supplement has, has Ayurvedic herbs in it, like glutacol and turmeric and, and the common ones that you know, but it's also got trace amounts of gold and pearl. And these minerals are oh, very strengthening to the neurons, the mind, and the nervous system. And so they allow that coordination to be there more lively, more connectivity is there because that's what minerals do. They, they enhance connectivity between the cells and the neurons. And so the supplement is, is taken ideally, uh, but most people are like... Uh, uh, you know, kind of like almost a normal it has to be taken, but ideally it's taken between 3.30 a.m. and 5.30 a.m. Hmm. So, and the reason why that is, okay. is because the system, the, nerve, the physiology is clear then. So anything that you actually do, whether it's taking a supplement, whether it's studying, whether it's meditating, whether it's setting intentions, it's actually a very powerful period of the day. To, to do those things because like your mind is very settled and it's, it's like your, your intentions are more lively in your mind and they're more, more heard by, you know, did point. you say at like 3 AM, 3 30, three, between 3 30 and 5 30, basically before the okay. sunrise, right? Those couple of before hours, the sunrise. Okay. A couple of hours before the sun rises are very powerful times for kind of those things that I mentioned. And so it's encouraged to take smriti during these time, or, you know, when you finish sleeping, get up, take it at first thing in the morning, because you want to get that intelligence into your body to kind of strengthen those cells before you take on your day. Wow. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, do you have anything else that you wanted to add? A couple, a couple of things actually. Okay, great. But the first thing is that a lot of leaders and, and, and people in general, we make achievement the goal. 
the ultimate goal is fulfillment, right? And fulfillment is not something we achieve. Fulfillment is something that's already innate. It's something that we experience. And fulfillment ultimately comes from experiencing what your true nature is, which is consciousness, your bliss consciousness. Uh, you're not your thoughts. You're not your emotions because they all change and evolve. But as you become more intimately connected to the, the true nature of what you are, then you find that innately you're fulfilled and then innately achievement comes more naturally and more evolutionary out of that fulfillment. Because a lot of people, especially leaders, are trying to get achievement to feel fulfilled. But we all know there's so many people that have achieved great things and then feel empty. Right. Because they thought that achievement was the goal, but, it's, but fulfillment's the goal. So I think that's very important, you know, to, for, for everyone to realize, you know, we're here to be fulfilled in who we are and, and our purpose and, and then what comes out of our purpose and what we do. So I think that's, that's a, a strong message that we like to get across to leaders. You know, initially when we started this business, we, we thought, oh, we, have, we'd, we'd work with these leaders so they can achieve more. And then we realized, yeah, but that, that's not the goal, you know. And, and so the goal is, is to really be fulfilled and and then also, I think the, the next thing, most important thing, if, if something, if you're do, doing something and you're focused on doing something, but somehow it's not getting the effect that you want, then you have to go even deeper than those things. And you have to go into that realm of believing and, and having clarity, you know, about what you really are and what you really want to create. Uh, because a lot of people get caught up in the doing and they're focusing, but they're not believing. They're not really owning the reality and believing in the reality they want to create. So they're just working hard and they're getting really busy and they're getting really tired and they're getting really stressed. And so what we found is that leaders who can really get the believing part of the equation right and really have that crystal clear clarity about what they are creating and then believing in it, then when they do do the actions, they get more support from their environment. It's like you get it right from the inside. So an example of this is, our top client we worked with for 10 years, the one I mentioned grew a company from 1 billion, actually grew company from 8 million to, to was like 8 billion by the time we retired. And he had the situation where he had opportunity to really leapfrog the company from 3 billion to 6 billion through a reverse merger acquisition. And initially when he presented this vision to the major shareholders, they said, no, we don't want to do this. It's going to ruin the stock price, the culture, and the performance of the company. And he comes back to us and goes, guys, I, I know we have to do this, but I'm not getting support from my environment to do this. And this is a common thing with leaders that they have a vision for something, but they're not getting the full support from their environment for it to materialize. So we said to him, well, you can go and intellectually try and convince these people that this is the right thing to do, or we can just work on you owning this reality and believing this reality more fully, more clearly inside of yourself first. He says, okay, let's work on me. So we did that for three, four weeks. And then we go, okay, Mark, we think you really, you know, you've really locked this into yourself that this is what you want to create. Go and talk to them again now. He did that, gave the talk. Every one of those major shareholders said, we get it now. We, but what they're really saying is we get that you own this reality more clearly. Right. So let's, let's give it a go. That was the first obstacle I've become. The second obstacle was making the deal work, long hours, tight time frames, many multiple no-go hurdles, many possibilities for stress. And he said, despite all that, he felt like he was the eye of the storm. He was very calm, very relaxed, and the deal fell into place. Right. So, so he, he had, we had that. So it all starts within yourself, your inner self. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you can't see it in yourself, then it's hard for others to see it outside of you that you're trying to convince. Right. right. So, I mean, that, that was a great science of achievement experience. But as I said, that same CEO you know, a couple of years later, driving all that progress and not really taking care of himself on the inside, he, you know, he had a stroke to say, hey, this is not the goal. The goal is for you to be fulfilled. Hmm. Very wise words. I really appreciate the lessons. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We, we, like this, is, this hasn't, all this knowledge hasn't happened. You know, I didn't know this, you know, 10 years ago or even five years ago. This is a this experience is, you know, as you go through experiences, you realize, okay, experience brings out knowledge, right? And so this knowledge is, 
has been refined, you know, based on our experience through our own consciousness and through interacting with these leaders. And, and we've, we've realized that, hey, let's just get people to fulfillment and then let achievement come out of that. And that's going to protect them in the process. And, and fulfillment, you know, if we want to decide what is fulfillment, fulfillment is experiencing your true nature. But And what that means is that you have a settled mind and you have a content heart, right? So, and so then the, the mind and the heart are in, in harmony with each other. They're not in conflict with each other. And you just feel really good. You just, you know, right. and the simplicity fulfillment is you just feel really good all the time or most of the time because you are fulfilled in who you are. Thank you so much for being with me today. I appreciate the time you've spent. It's a true pleasure, Lauren. I, I love what you're doing. What you're doing is so important for the world right now. And I, I think, you know, your, uh, your podcasts and, and your messages and your interviews uh, are just going to be really well sought after because it's such important, relevant. What you're doing is relevant and timely. So thank you so much for my opportunity to contribute to that. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>